Good evening, church. I welcome you again in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. Thank you for those of you who partook in the Lord's Supper with me. We will get into the word for today. Father, we just thank you for this day, Lord. This is the wonderful day that you have made, and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Father, I pray for our realm of word from heaven, God. I pray that you'll do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we could ask or think. Father, I pray that you will meet every one of your people's needs according to your riches and glory by Christ Jesus. We pray that every need will be met, God. We pray that you'll do exceedingly abundantly above all that we could ask or think. We pray that our um, souls will be safe today. Bodies will be healed. We pray those in need of jobs that you will pro provide for them, Lord. Father, we thank you that you're able to do exceedingly abundantly above all that we can ask or think. We thank you, Lord, that no good thing will you withhold from those who walk uprightly. We just praise you and we bless you. And we thank you for everything that will be said and done today. And I pray that I will be guided, led, and controlled by the Holy Spirit. Let it be all of you and none of me. You'll be glorified. You'll be magnified. Fill this place with your glory and your power. We ask this of you in Jesus' name. And we thank you and we praise you for it. Amen. Last week, I spoke on Speak the Word. And many people are only saying what they have instead of saying what they need or what they want. If we delight ourselves, if we delight ourselves, who's really saying, if we please the Lord, he will give us the desires of our heart. So you delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. So you have to say what you want and not what you have, because especially if what you have is something that you don't desire, you don't need to be saying that. For example, if, if you're not well, don't keep telling a million people, everybody you meet, or you're sick, you're going to die in two days, you're going to die in three days or whatever. If you desire a job, don't keep saying, oh, you're jobless. Or if you desire um, wealth and riches in your house, don't say I'm broke, busted and disgusted. You know, you say things, I'm out of debt, my needs are met. I have all sufficiency for all things. I do abound to all good works. There is no need in my life that is not met. My God supplies all my needs according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. I'm blessed to be a blessing. I'm the head always, never the tail. I'm above always, never beneath. You might be looking like the tail, but God says that you're the head and not the tail. You may look like if you're beneath, but God says you're above and not beneath. You may look like if you're in always in lack and in want of all good things, but the Lord said, but the Bible says in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd to feed, guide, and shield me. I shall not lack. It may look like if you're cursed, but God says you're blessed. We're blessed in the city. We're blessed in the field. We're blessed in our coming in. We're blessed in our going out. So you say what God says. Repeat everything what God says about you like a parrot does. So that's what we have to do. God sets before us in Deuteronomy 30, 19, life and death, blessing and cursing. And he tells us to choose life that we and our descendants may live. So whatever you choose, it affects future generations. It does not just affect you. So we have to choose our words wisely. We have the power to speak life and we have the power to speak death. Let us choose life. Out of the same mouth, it should not proceed blessing and cursing, you know, because with the same mouth, we bless God. And then sometimes people tend to curse others who God created in the image of God. So we need to be careful, mindful of what we're saying. You know, what we're saying about his body, he created people in his image. So instead of using your mouth to curse someone and bring destruction in their lives, because life and death is in the power of the tongue. We will look at Proverbs 18, 21 soon. But let's go quickly to Deuteronomy chapter 30. And we'll read verses 19 to 20. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 to 20. Why do we read verses again and again? Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It's just like how you practice your timetables as a kid, or you learn the alphabet and your parent taught you it over and over again till you became proficient in it. It's the same thing with the Bible. Is a saying, practice makes perfect. Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 19 to 20. I call heaven and earth to witness this day against you, that I have set before you life and death, 
the blessings and the curses. Therefore, choose life that you and your descendants may live. So that whatever choices we make, whatever decisions we make, it doesn't just affect us and our family members that are alive now, but it affects future generations. If I make a bad decision and say if I went out and I smoked a whole heap of dope and I drank a lot of rum and all kinds of um, beverages, strong alcoholic beverages, and if I destroyed my liver, you know, if, if I destroyed my lungs through smoking, or if I destroyed my health through overeating or eating all the salty food and I had high blood pressure and if um, I got a stroke or a heart attack, it would not just affect me. It would affect um, people who are here on this earth and it affects future generations. Because if you're unhealthy and then you give birth to a set of unhealthy children, it's because you sowed. I mean, some people are have been born with disabilities and so on. So I'm not saying everybody who is sick that it's their fault or anything. So don't take the teaching out of context. But if I'm sowing really bad seeds, then chances are if I'm just drinking alcohol, binging, smoking a lot of dope and other things, then um, it may produce a baby that is very unhealthy. So we um, we reap what, what we sow. And sometimes we're not even reaping what we sow. Sometimes we're reaping bad seeds from what other people have sown. So whatever we do not only affects us and has the power to affect, it has the power to affect future generations, but thank God that God has um, redeemed us from all generational curses, but we still need to be wise with what we're doing. Verse 20. And may love the Lord your God, obey his voice and cling to him for he is your life and the length of your days, that you may dwell in the land which the Lord swore to give to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. God knew he could trust Abraham, so he was able to tell him his secret. And he trusted Abraham because he knew that he would command his children and his children's children to walk in the ways of the Lord. Abraham simply believed God, and he became a friend of God. He didn't do everything perfectly, but he believed God. Believe the Lord and you shall be established. Believe his prophets and so shall you prosper. Please go to Proverbs 18, 21. Proverbs 18, 21, and it's just before Psalms. And I love the book of Proverbs. In fact, I love the entire Bible. There's so much wisdom, there's so much knowledge, there's so much understanding. And we must trust in the Lord with all our heart and lean not onto our own understanding. In all our ways, we should acknowledge him and he will direct our paths. We need to fear God and keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. Proverbs 18 verse 21, debt and life are in the power of the tongue. So this little tongue that we have, it can cause a lot of trouble or it can cause a lot of blessings. So let's choose to use our tongues to inflict blessings on others and not curses. And they who indulge in it shall eat the fruit of it for death or life. So the devil has done his hardest. He's worked really hard to pervert, to pervert language. And people say things that they don't want to come to pass and then they expect a different result. You know, someone may cook a nice pot of food or something, or they may have enjoyed a really good godly movie or something. And then they say, that's sick. But yet God says he hates perverse speech. So we need to uh, be careful what we're saying. Say what you mean and mean what you say. Don't pervert the English language or whatever language you are speaking. Because when, when we do things like that, we confuse our heart. It is like somebody might say they're uh, bursting to have a wee. You're not bursting to have a wee. You, you really need to have a wee quickly. I need to go to the toilet quickly. Just say what you mean. Because next thing, after saying that for years and years, then an appendix or something bursts, and then they wondered, how did this happen? 
you know, I'm a good Christian. I've been tithing. I've been having a good diet and so on. You want to know because you, you said the wrong things and out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. So we need to watch our words and say what we would like to have. So we give God honor and we give God glory. Today, uh, we will be looking at Mark chapter five, which tells us about the man who had the legions of demons and he hung out by the Pope, by the um, tombs. Yet the living should not be hanging out with the dead. Why was he hanging out by the tombs? Because he had an unclean spirit and he was not in his right mind. Even though God hasn't given believers a spirit of fear, but he's given us the spirit of power, love, and a sound mind. He hasn't given anybody the spirit of fear, but he's given us all this, the spirit of power. That's the same spirit of God, the spirit of the lovely one, the spirit of the perfect one, power, love, and a sound mind. Last week when we were talking about um, speak, speaking the word, we looked at Mark chapter 5 and we had the woman who had the issue of blood. She doesn't have it anymore because she's delivered, she's healed, she's been set free. And he who the son sets free is free indeed because she kept saying, if I may but touch the hem of his garment, I shall be whole. And she caught what she said. She pressed through the crowds and she touched the hem of Jesus' garment and she was made whole. And Jesus accredited that miracle to her faith. Thy faith had made thee whole. We spoke about the centurion who was found in Luke chapter 7. His servant was grievously ill at the point of death. And this was a man who had invested much into the kingdom of God. He had built the people a synagogue out of his own money. So this was not a poor man and this was the centurion's servant and the servant was rich. So how much richer was the centurion if his servant was so rich that he had the money, he had the ability to build a synagogue out of his own money. And I'm sure he had lots more left. And so the people, he, he was testifying actually, the centurion was testifying about the goodness of his servant, what he had done. And he was saying to the Lord, he is worthy. You know, this guy, he really serves the Lord with gladness. He serves the Lord with his heart, with his finances, not just with his mouth. And he was at the point of death. And he sent some elders and he says, um, come to, to my house, you know, and so my servant can be healed. Because he knew if his servant made contact with Jesus, the anointed one and his anointing, that he would be well again. And then he thought things over again and he says, ah, oh, you know, I am a centurion and I have people working below me, you know, or working side by side. I'm a commander and I issue instructions. I issue orders. And I say to this one, go and do this, go and do that. And they do it. And then he says, you know, there is real power in the word. So he says, just speak a word. Don't bother to come to my house anymore. I'm not worthy to to be in your presence. I'm not worthy to have you under my roof, but just speak a word. <laughs> speak a word and my servant shall be whole or healed, whichever one he said. And Jesus obviously spoke the word. And we said that the word of God cannot return to him void, Isaiah 55, 11. I said in Jeremiah 1, 12, that he watches over his word to perform it. I said in Hebrews 1, 3, he upholds all things by the word of his power. And we know in Hebrews 13, 8, Jesus is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We know in Malachi 3, 6, that God is the God he cannot change. See, he's always been healing. Healing has not passed away with the apostles since he's the same yesterday, today, and forever. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed and harassed of the devil, according to Acts 10, 38. And he is still going about doing good. He's using our hands. He's using our mouth. Praise God. Because he gave the disciples power over the unclean spirits to heal the sick, to cleanse the lepers, to raise the dead. Even in um, Luke 10, the disciples, they came back rejoicing because they had cast out demons and things like that. 
And Jesus was saying, don't, don't be rejoicing because the demons are subject to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. So the centurion, he knew the um, authority of the word. And he said, just speak a word. And his servant was made whole in the self same hour. So there is power in the word. There is power in the words we speak. Don't ever speak to your children and say, oh, you'll never amount to nothing. Your grandfather was a liar. He was an alcoholic. Your father, he, he, he was a fornicator. He cheated on, on, on me. He, he, your granddad, he did the same thing. Your great granddad did that. And you're going to amount to nothing. Or you have a son and say, you're going to be just like your grandfather. I good for nothing. Don't ever, ever speak that. You have enough. We have enough enemies without you making yourself an enemy. Don't let your mouth become your enemy. Don't let your mouth curse you. Use your mouth to bless yourself and to bless others. It doesn't matter what it looks like. Speak life. As we read in Deuteronomy 30, 19. 19. Because God sets before us life and death, blessing and cursing. Therefore, choose life. It's like a multiple choice test. And God so kindly gives us the answers. We spoke about blind Bartimaeus. He was a blind beggar. And he heard that Jesus was in town. And he, he kept saying, you know, Jesus, thou son of David, have mercy on me. And the people told him to shut up, be quiet. <laughs> it's like sometimes God gives you a dream. He may give you a dream that you're going to um, go into all the world and preach the gospel. Or you might have a television broadcast. Or he may give you a dream that you're going to own this... Um, garage and you're going to have so many branches or you're going to invent this jam and it's going to be so many franchises all over the world and so many people are going to be eating your jam and you're going to become a multi-millionaire or a multi-billionaire and then people will just tell you shut up like they told blind Bartimaeus to shut up but the more they told him to be quiet the more he kept speaking so speak your fight and because of his persistence like the persistent widow in Luke 18 she wouldn't shut up. She kept going to that judge, you know, until he vindicated her against her adversary and she won. <laughs> he got to the point that he was so fed up with this persistent widow woman in Luke 18 that she kept persisting. And he said, in case she strangles me, he'll just give her what she wanted. And she won her case. So you have to be persistent. Don't give up at the first sign of trouble so you have your dream and everybody's telling you to shut up like they told blind Bartimaeus to shut up and because of his persistence he didn't shut up he kept shouting no more Jesus thou son of David have mercy on me and Jesus said bring him out there or whatever and he says what do you want me to do and he says I want to receive my sight and, and Jesus um made him receive his sight and he was able to see so don't let people shut you up don't let them shut down your dreams they tried to shut down Joseph's Joseph's dreams and Joseph wouldn't shut up. You know, they, they put him, his brothers sold him to the um, Ishram, Ishmaelites. They put him in a pit. They sold him to the Ishmaelites. The Ishmaelites sold him to Potiphar, who was an officer of Pharaoh. Praise God. And Pharaoh's wife lied on innocent Joseph, saying that he tried to rape her when he didn't try to rape her. And then he, he was put in prison all the time. He was doing good and his situation just seemed to be getting worse and worse and worse. He was going from one, one tragedy into another, one problem into another. And he's probably thinking, why me? <laughs> but the scripture doesn't make any um, note of him complaining, having a bad attitude. So he was in charge of Potiphar's house and he was doing a real good job. And then the wife set her eyes on him. She lusted after Joseph, young Joseph. And he says, how can I do this wicked thing and sin against God? I, you know, he wasn't going to lie with her. And then she caught hold of his garment and he ran away and left the garment in her hand. And she appeared to have evidence. Some people appear to have evidence against you. Your enemies, they may plot and they may scheme how they can bring you down. But vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So don't worry with your enemies. You will be vindicated. It doesn't matter how bad it looks. Some of you are having court cases and you're worried. Don't worry. It's a scripture. It says, you know, don't worry about what you're going to say in, in the courtroom. God will speak on your behalf. Just like how eventually Joseph was vindicated, even though he, he went to prison and all these things. And he suffered wrongfully. And he even interpreted the dreams of the butler and the baker. And the butler, he had a favorable dream. And he was 
restored to his former job with Pharaoh. And he says, remember me. And he didn't remember Joseph. Joseph had a chance to become bitter again, but he didn't. He continued working in the prison and serving with gladness. You know, he didn't look as look onto it as if he was serving man, but he was serving God. And he served with a good attitude. Praise the name of Jesus. And then one day when Pharaoh had the two dreams and he, he couldn't interpret them. And then the butler remembered his faults. And Pharaoh sent hastily for Joseph. And Joseph shaved. And he came and he, and he said, interpretation belongs to the Lord. And he interpreted the dreams. He didn't take any credit for it. He interpreted Pharaoh's dreams. And because of him, in the time of a famine, the seven years of famine, they, they were able to abundantly prosper because in the seven years of plentiful, they had put away and they were able to sell to other nations. And he, Joseph became the prime minister. So he suffered for a long time. But then he was promoted to the prime minister. So apart from Pharaoh, he was the next one in line. Any decisions, anything was going on in the line, in the land, they had to go to Joseph. So you may be suffering now, yet yeah, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, fear no evil, for God is with you. Continue persisting, continue obeying, continue trusting God, and God will bring you out. He is our vindicator. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. So don't try to, to get um, revenge. If your enemy curse you, bless them. If they're hungry, feed them. If they're thirsty, give them something to drink. And in so doing, you're heaping coals of fire upon their head. You know, they're, they're seeing the goodness of you. You know, they, they've lied in you. They cheated in you. They probably slept with your husband. Praise God. Or uh, Hallelujah. If you're a man, your best friend probably slept with your wife and all that. You continue being good to them. And then they want to know why. And then one day their heart will melt and they'll be able to give their hearts to the Lord because of the good example that you set. And a woman by her lifestyle, she can win her husband over to the Lord by having a good godly lifestyle. Because she might have been unequally yoked. She might have been, two unbelievers might have been married and then she became saved. And then by her lifestyle, she can win her husband over to the Lord. So I said, let's go to Mark chapter five. As we look at this man who had the legions of demons and he was hanging out with the dead when the living should not be hanging out with the dead. Praise the name of Jesus. Please go to your Bibles and go to Mark chapter 5, comments in verse 1. And I'm reading from the Amplified Version unless I say otherwise. Lord, we bless you and we praise you. They came to the other side of the sea, to the regions of Gernerzes. And as soon as he got out of the boat, they met him out of the tomb, a man under the power of an unclean spirit. So they went over to the other side. And as soon as they went there, they, they saw this man who was under the power, under the control of an unclean spirit. There are many spirits in the world. That's why we need to have the spirit of discernment. As it says in 1 John 4, we need to be able to discern. You try the spirits to see if they're coming from God or if they're from the enemy. Even though someone may be telling you things about yourself and stuff, sometimes they're just having a familiar spirit. It's not always coming from God and all signs and wonders are not coming from God. Some of them are, but the devil, even in with um, Moses, as we read in the book of Exodus, Moses, um, I think he put out his rod or whatever it was, or he threw it down, and then they came out frogs, and the Egyptians with their enchantments, the magicians and so on, they were able to perform similar signs, but they weren't able to get rid of the frogs. Pharaoh would always have to come to this to entreat his God. So we give God honor and we give God glory. God is wonderful and he is powerful. So even though the devil tries to imitate the anointing of God, he can go so far. Even when um, Moses, I think he threw down the rod on the Egyptians, they did the same thing and it was Moses' rod that swallowed up their rod. 
So greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So whatever situation you're finding yourself in, God is able to bring you out. Better days are to come. It's not the end. It's not over. So keep, keep on. Keep on keeping on. Cast not away your confidence. It had great recompense of reward. For you have need of steadfast patience that after you've done the will of God, you will receive the promises of God. Through faith and patience, Abraham was able to inherit the promises of God. So um, Jesus was met by this man who had the unclean spirit and he was under the power of the unclean spirit. He was subjected to the evil spirit because he was a man and if he was in, in his right mind, he would not be hanging out in the tombs. The living should not be hanging out with the dead. Even there was, um, Jesus had wanted his um, disciples to come and follow him. And then there was one saying that uh, he wanted to go and bury his father first. And Jesus said, let the dead bury the dead. It wasn't that he didn't have compassion, but the, the living should not be hanging out with the dead. Praise God. I'm not saying that if you've lost a loved one, that you're not to bury that person and stuff, but you can't just be mourning all the time. In, in the days of Moses, they would usually mourn for people, but it was about 30 days if it was someone of great significance and importance. And they had different periods of time. But after that time, they would have to go and do the work of the Lord. Because even after Moses had died, uh, God told um, Joshua, Moses, my servant is dead. And he told him, you know, he had to go on and do the works. So those of you who have lost loved ones, I'm not making lightly of you. But sometimes when you keep yourself busy, it, it helps. I'm not saying anything or anyone can replace your loved one. But God is a um, forgiving God and time helps to heal. I'm not saying it will ever be the same. I'm not belittling anything. I've lost loved ones too. But, but God can heal and time <coughs> is a healer. And then once the person was born again, you're going to see them in heaven. So you don't have to worry. Pardon me. Weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning and your loved ones would have wanted you to be happy. They don't want you to commit suicide. So keep on keeping on. If, even if you don't want to do it for yourself, do it for the other people who love you and need you. <clears throat> so suicide, excuse me, is out of the picture. Mark chapter 5 verse 3. This man continually lived among the tombs and no one could subdue him anymore, even with a chain. So he was living among the tombs. Normally, someone in their right minds, they're not going to want to be living among the tombs. You know, that's where you're going to see like the flies, the maggots and all kinds, kinds of things. But it's not a comfortable place for the living to be there continually. He, he was not operating out of the mind of Christ. He didn't have the mind of Christ. He was depressed. He was out of his mind. He was a madman. You know, he, he was not operating like a normal person. His behavior was weird. It was abnormal. And he was terrifying the um, community. Could you imagine if there was a school nearby? I could imagine how the children there were petrified. They were terrified. Some children were probably having nightmares, wetting their beds. If every time they to go to school that they had to pass this madman who was there. And, and it, it was not fun. I can imagine the house prices, prices for that area would have fallen. You know, it would have been an area where no one wanted to live if someone had money and stuff. Well, even people who didn't have money would have wanted to live there. It was probably known as an area like where some people say, oh, that's a haunted house there or whatever. But it's just demons manifesting themselves. You know, because like um, Creflo Dollar, he, he is not afraid of um, demons and all of that. He says just because a uh, demon can make, well, I'll use an example. It may not be the exact example that he used, even though the demons may be able to make a book move or whatever. He's basically saying, we can pick up a book and make it move. So we don't have to fear because God has not, he has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells on the inside of us and greater is he 
that is in us than he that is in the world. And he says in Isaiah 41, 10, fear not. He says, stop the fear, refuse fear, be not afraid. Why is he saying that? Because I am with you. The great I am that I am is with you. The one with whom all things are possible is with you if you're a born again Christian. And even if you're not born again, God is still following you all over. Whether you're going to the bar, whether you're going to the sex shop, wherever you're going, God is following you because he has the Holy Spirit there with you and he's convicting you and trying to get you on the right path, on the narrow path. The wide path is broad and there are many there, but there's a narrow path and Jesus is the way, the truth and the life. And he's doing his utmost to get you on the narrow path so that you can be born born again. Nicodemus came to Jesus by night and he said, what shall I do to be born again? Jesus said, that which is of the flesh is of the flesh. That which is of the spirit is of the spirit. You must be born again. And he's saying, can I enter my mother's womb the second time and be born again? And Jesus is saying, no, no, no. He had to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and be born again. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. And it's a wonderful name. It's a powerful name. It's a healing name. It's a redemptive name. There is power in the name of Jesus. Demons tremble at the name of Jesus. And every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Lord. So this man, he continually hung out at, by the um, tombs. He terrified the neighborhoods. Children were afraid of him. I could imagine them wetting their beds constantly. Children not wanting to go to school. They were probably having nightmares. You know, but greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. So verse four, Mark five, verse four. And thank you for those of you who are now joining us. For he had been bound often with shackles for the feet and handcuffs, but the handcuffs of light chains, he wrenched apart. So he was operating in a supernatural strength, but that supernatural strength was not coming from God. He had a supernatural strength like Samson. But the supernatural strength that Samson had was coming from God. Whereas in his death, he was able to take down more of the um, Philistines or the people in his death than when he was alive, when he made that whole building come down. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's have a look at what Samson did before we come back. Because some people, because they see signs and wonders, Every time they're thinking it's Jesus, oh, it's God, you know. Remember, believers don't have to be looking for signs. Signs follow believers, not believers following signs. Every time they hear something, they have to be running and going. Not everything that's happening with signs and wonders is coming from God. The devil can do signs and wonders. And we will read about that in Luke 24 as well before we close. Let's go to Judges chapter 14, verse 6. Judges chapter 14, verse 6, but please hold your place in Mark chapter 5 because we're planning to come back there. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges. So Judges 14, chapter 14, verse 6. So if, if you don't know where it is, go to your table of contents. There's no harm in doing that. That's why it's there. Praise the name of Jesus. And here I am in Deuteronomy. No wonder I'm not seeing <laughs> what I wanted to see. Judges, praise God. Chapter 14, verse 6. God is so good. He is so worthy. And the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon him. That is, we're talking about Samson. And he tore the lion as he would have torn a kid. And he had nothing in his hand. But he did not tell his father or mother what he had done. It's the same thing with David when he killed the lion and the bear with his bare hands. You know, when the lion and the bear tried to take a lamb from his father's flock. And then he, he knew that he could kill Goliath, the circumcised, the uncircumcised Philistine who was defying the armies of the living God. David was not afraid. Why was he not afraid? He knew that God was with him. He knew that greater is he that is in him than he that is in the world. He knew that he could do all things through Christ, which strengthens, the, which strengthens us. He knew that he was more than a, more, more than a conqueror. He knew that he was more than an overcom overcomer. He knew that all things were possible with God. And we, we know that as well. So let's go to Judges 16, 30. Because in the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit would come upon them and they could perform a task. And after the Holy Spirit would depart, but the Holy Spirit stayed continually with David. There were some other people and prophets that the Holy Spirit dwelt with them. But thank God with New Testament saints, 
the Holy Spirit is living with us all the time. And we must grieve not the Holy Spirit, whereby we are sealed unto the day of redemption. Judges chapter 16, verse 30. And Samson cried, let me die with the Philistines. And he bowed himself mightily and the house fell upon the princess and upon all the people that were in it. So the dead whom he slew in his death were more than they whom he slew in his life. Praise the name of Jesus. God is wonderful. God is powerful. And before we return to Mark chapter 5, Please go to Matthew, no, Luke. Um, I'll tell you where it is. Matthew 24, verse 22. Because some people are just following signs and wonders. So Matthew 24, verse 22, but we really wanted to focus on verse 24, but I'll start from verse 22. But, but if those days had not been shortened, this is the times that we're living in now, the end times, no human being would endure and survive because we're going through perilous times. We have the pandemic, the coronavirus, and there are going to be many more, sadly to say, because if you read Matthew chapter 24, it tells us about it, you know. They're going to be, two people are going to be grinding, two women are going to be grinding in the mill. One is going to be taken and one is going to be left. There's going to be so many things are uh, going to be happening. Rumors of wars, you know, pestilence, perilous times, parents against children, children against parents. And many false prophets are going to be coming. And no human would, would endure and survive. But for the sake of the elect, God's chosen ones, those days will be shortened. So that's why every time when, when you when you look in now, it seems like if you're into a new month, a new day or whatever. Because for me, like every time before I turn around or I can do too many things, I'm seeing it's a Sunday again, a Sunday, a Sunday, because God has speeded up the time for his elect. Even though it's 24 hours in a day, somehow he, he shortened it. You can speak to children and the children will tell you the time is flying. I remember when I was younger and I was sitting down on the stairs at home and I was counting off the days because I was saying, oh, I can't wait till I'll be 21 because at that time when you're 21, then you'll be an adult. And I was thinking when you're an adult, you can do anything. But then they changed it and they said when you're 18 that you, you can be an adult. But I remember counting off to 21 and it seems like forever and ever and ever. <laughs> And I've done 21 more than twice. So we thank God. God is a good God. He's a wonderful God. He's a perfect God. So those of you who wanted to know my age, you have an idea. <laughs> God is good. And every day is a blessing from God. I'm not ashamed to get old. It's a blessing. Praise the name of Jesus. Not everyone lives to see my age. Verse 23. If anyone says to you, then behold, here is Christ, the Messiah. Here is the Christ, the Messiah. Or there he is. Do not believe it. So many false prophets are going to come professing to be Christ and they're not. Verse 24. For false Christ and false prophets will arise and they will show great signs and wonders. That's what I wanted to tell you about, you know, about the signs and wonders. Not because signs and wonders are happening in a meeting in a church or wherever someone can tell you things about yourself. It means it's coming from God. Some people are hearing from familiar spirits. Even some pastors are as well. And they will show great signs and wonders so as to deceive and lead astray, if possible, even the elect, God's chosen ones. So God has warned us about these things beforehand. Now let's get back to our key text about the man who was hanging out by the tombs and terrifying the nations. <laughs> I suppose people were scared. He was kind of like Goliath when he, when he stood on that mountain and he was terrifying the Israelites, terrifying Saul and all those trained um, soldiers. They should have been skilled in, in, in fighting. And they had the uncircumcised Philistine terrifying them. So these people were afraid of this man in Mark chapter 5. So they, they had um, bound him with chains and things like that. And then he would rub them together. And he was so strong, he would break these chains. 
So for he had, this is verse four, Mark five, verse four. For he had been banged often with shackles for the feet and handcuffs. But the handcuffs of light chains he wrenched apart and the shackles he rubbed and ground together and broke in pieces and no one had strength enough to restrain or tame him. So he had a supernatural strength, probably similar to what Samson had, but Samson's strength came from the Lord. Samson was a, a Nazarite and he wasn't to drink any strong drink from his birth or anything. His hair wasn't supposed to be cut, but he got mixed up with the wrong woman. And then she convinced him to tell the, the secrets. And then um, his hair was cut off and he, he lost his strength temporarily. So but we thank God that his hair did grow back. And as we read about what happened in the end, when he was able to take down more Philistines than he did in his lifetime, he did that in his death when he died. So night and day among the tombs and on the mountain, he was always shrieking and screaming and beating and bruising and cutting himself with stones. You know, that sounds to me like the thief who only comes to steal, kill and destroy. So he was possessed by an unclean spirit and the unclean spirit had him hurting himself similar to the little boy in mark chapter 9 so hold your place in mark 5 hopefully we will be able to come back but we want the holy spirit to have his way let's go to mark chapter 9 because this this little boy he would fall into the fire into the waters and he was foaming and people were afraid of him as well and it was the evil spirits that were in him that was causing him to manifest such horrible behaviors giving him seizures and all these things i suppose he didn't have many friends you know people were so afraid of him so sometimes when you see someone acting in an ugly way sometimes it is the demon that's inside them that needs to be cast out many many times um people are thinking oh they're fighting with that person that person hates them but we're not flesh wrestling with flesh and blood but principalities powers Rulers of darkness, spiritual wickedness in high places. So um, people may be behaving, someone may be horrible to you, lying on you and all these things. Your battle is not with them. It's, it's, with, it's those evil spirits. So Mark chapter 9 verse 17. And one of the throne replied to him, Teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a dumb spirit. So the spirit was making this guy, he couldn't speak. You know, took away his speech. Yet we said life and death is in the power of the tongue. So he, he didn't have the ability to speak life into his situation. So that is a horrible situation to um, be dumb. Have someone else to do your speaking for you. Sometimes he could have been believing God by his stripes and healed. And then people are probably saying, oh, he's got dumb spirit. He's had it from his birth. It's this and saying all kinds of bad things. And he didn't have the ability to cancel out those curses to speak life into his situation, to speak life so he and his seed would live. But praise God that help was on the way. And wherever it lays hold of him, so as to make him it, its own, it dashes him down and convulses him and he foams at the mouth. So you can imagine as a terrifying um, situation, all this horrible foam, this... um grizzly saliva and everything is just coming out his eyes are probably all rolled up and it's just like a horror picture looking completely horrible and scary and grinds his teeth so he was like having all these seizures and he falls into a motionless stupor as if wasting away so when his eyes were rolling and all this um like froth coming from his mouth you know he made the picture of a horror story and people were terrified and you can imagine his poor dad, how he, how he felt. So when, when he fell down, he didn't he probably didn't even know what this guy is going to live or die. Is he going to survive this seizure? And all that was coming from the devil who only comes to steal, kill and destroy. Because this guy was demon possessed, like the man who had the legions of demons. And I asked your disciples to drive it out. So he didn't say to drive him out because it was an evil spirit. Praise the name of Jesus. Human beings have um, power, more power than every evil spirit because even the spirit the evil um spirits that had the unclean spirit that possessed the man in mark 5 he had to ask um jesus to be cast into pigs so the pigs had more authority on this earth than that evil spirit even though it was legions of 
demons were possessing the, the guy in Mark chapter 5 that had him hanging around the tombs and acting like a madman. And even when Jesus healed him and he was in the, his right mind, instead of the people thanking Jesus for healing him, they sent Jesus away. You know, because it's just like there's a time when people, and it's happening right now, they call good evil and evil good. Uh, and that's what it says in the Bible. Scripture tells us that. So uh, this this guy, he had his son and he, he didn't know whether he was going to live or die. He Every time he had these seizures and he was wasting away and he was motionless. I could imagine him trying to take his pulse, see if he was okay. Wasn't sure if he was going to attack him. What was going to happen? And I asked your disciples to drive it out, but they were not able to do it. But they were able to do it because Jesus had given them power over the unclean spirits to cast them out. But because of fear, they, 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 they weren't able to do it. You know, we can do all things through Christ, which strengthens us. So because um, fear overtook their fate when, when they were trying to cast that demon out of the um, little boy, then they failed. Because where fear is, fate is um, almost absent or it's contaminated and it's not working properly. Because when people fear, they tend to panic. Some people can have panic attacks they can be paralyzed in fear but god has not given us the spirit of fear i think it's is it second timothy 1 7 but of power love and a sound mind i receive the first timothy 2 verse 7 he's given us power love and a sound mind the same spirit that raised jesus from the dead dwells on the inside of us so when we're feeling fear it's gonna happen because we are in a, a, a fallen world Satan is the God of this world and he's going to try and terrorize you, stop you in your tracks, stop you from running, stop you from driving your car, from riding a bike, from going to work. And you give him an inch and he's going to take a yard because every time you give in to him, he's going to want to, you know, say so if, he, if he stopped you from um, driving on the motorway, next thing he's not going to want you to drive on the road at all. And then it might come to a point he don't even want you to leave your house or whatever. So we have to speak our faith and we need to speak the word and we need to do things. Sometimes you have to do it afraid, little by little. Because I remember when I, when I was younger, I nearly drowned in the swimming pool. We went, we had the class outing. I was about 12. Mom didn't want me to go. My siblings begged for me to go. My mom says, okay, then, well, don't go in the water. I was disobedient. I went in the water just a little bit over my ankles. I didn't even go up to my knees. And then um, I was sitting on the beach on the sun enjoying the dance. And the children said, oh, this guy is Siaka Cox from my class. He says, oh, everybody's wet except Pamela. And then the children, about quite a few of them, they dragged me in. And I couldn't swim, you see. And, and then they let me go. And I was trying to hold on to some nearby bushes and things like that. So I had several nearby um, experiences of drowning. And it wasn't really good. And then Kenneth Copeland, he was preaching about fear when the 9-11 um, horrible event occurred. And then eventually I was able to go because I would swim when I had my swimming lessons and so on. And I was less afraid. And I would like to stand up. But it was time to move out into the deep. Like, like when um, Jesus told Peter to cast this net out into the deep for a haul of fish. And so I was able to swim in a swimming pool twice when my feet couldn't touch the bottom. But I haven't been doing much swimming lately, especially with this um, coronavirus and things like that. God knows when we're going to get back to normal. But we have faith in God. So God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. So when we feel afraid... It doesn't mean that you're afraid. It is, fear is the presence of Satan. He is the spirit of fear. And you know, the Bible tells us in Psalm 16, 11, thou will show thee the parts of life in thy presence is the fullness of joy and at his right hand there are pleasures forevermore. So when you're in God's presence, the fear will go. But because you feel in the, the, the uh, presence of Satan, then you feel that spirit of fear, panic, you know, uh, panic attacks, don't want to breathe. And all these things but we have to speak the word of god you, you can't just sit down it's like the devil he's coming with you with every weapon he has and the word of god is powerful and is sharper than any two-edged sword and we need to speak the word of god because you can't just sit down with with your mouth closed otherwise the devil will take advantage of you it's like if you're hungry and you and the food is there and you're not going to eat but we have the word even if you don't know it out of your head you can open a bible and speak the word. So 2 Timothy 1, 7, the Bible says, For God did not give us the spirit of timidity, of cowardice, 
of craving and cringing and fawning fear. He didn't give us the, 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 the spirit of fear. We're not chicken. You know, we should not supposed to be fearful. We're supposed to be faithful. And he, But he has given us the spirit of power and of love. The same spirit that raised God from the dead. He's given us his spirit and a calm and well-balanced mind and discipline and self-control. So you have to cast down the imaginations. When the fear comes, speak the word of God. Keep speaking it and it's going to get less and less. I'm not saying you're never going to feel fear because the devil he always tries to steal, kill and destroy. He will come after you, but you have to speak the word. So uh, back to our text in uh, Mark 9, but don't turn there yet because um, it was the evil spirit that was causing the little boy to manifest all these things and to throw himself into the fire and into the water because the devil was after his life, even though he was possessing this boy. But I'm saying because the guy took his son to the disciples and he says the disciples couldn't cast him out, but I'm saying they could have cast him out, could have cast it out. <laughs> but because of their fear, their fear, the fear overtook their fate and they became paralyzed in fear and they did, didn't do it because in Matthew chapter 10 verse 9, Jesus gave them, Matthew, sorry, Matthew chapter 10 verse 1, he gave them the power of overcome the, um, over the unclean spirits. Matthew chapter 10 verse 1, and Jesus summoned to him his 12 disciples and gave them power and authority over unclean spirits to drive them out and to cure all kinds of disease and all kinds of weakness and infirmity. So they had the ability, but they panicked. They, they looked at what was happening and they became afraid. And the fear is the first point of failure and it stopped their success in that case. But thank God, God is a present help in a time of trouble and Jesus is on his throne and he will never be overthrown. And he came to their rescue. Thank God for the man's persistence. He, he, he didn't give up. He didn't just curse God like how um, Job's wife wanted him to curse God and die when he was going through so many trials and tribulations, but Job did not. He persevered. He, he worshiped God in the time of his affliction. He shaved and he worshiped. So sometimes when you're going, in affliction, you're going through afflictions, you can praise and worship that um, God inhabits the praises of his people. That's why the devil wants all the churches to be shut down. There should be no singing, no this or that. It's just an attack from the enemy who only comes to steal, kill and destroy. But Jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly. So even in the time when you're feeling afraid or whatever, you can make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Serve the Lord with gladness. Because since God inhabits the praises of his people, then um, Satan, he inhabits the fear of God's people. So you can start singing a song, worshiping God in the beauty of holiness, in spirit and in truth, and Satan will flee from your presence because he didn't, he didn't want people to serve the Lord. Even in Exodus, when Moses was saying, you know, the people, let the people, let the Israelites go for a three day journey so they could worship God and offer sacrifices to God. And Pharaoh didn't want that. And he was representing Satan. So Satan is after your praise. If he's after your praise, he can get your joy. He can get your strength because the joy of the Lord is our strength. Even in 2 Chronicles chapter 20, the um, Jehoshaphat, when the enemies came against them, he called the fast, the entire land of Judah, all the young ones, the old ones and everybody, they were fasting and they prayed to the Lord. And, and um, the word of the Lord came to them. The battle is not yours, it's mine. And the praise and worship people, they sang. They went to battle with the praise and worship people singing. I don't even know if they had any instruments, you know, battle instruments. But they went forth praising the Lord. And then God confused the enemy. So pray and praise your way out. You're feeling afraid, you can start singing songs. You're feeling depressed, sing praise and worship songs to God. Put on something good. Praise God and your joy will, will come and you'll feel better. You can praise your way even in the middle of tears, in the middle of pain, in the middle of sorrow. And God will come true and he will fight your battle because he inhabits the praises of his people. So as you're afraid and you feel in the presence of God, as you begin to praise, you'll feel the presence of God and Satan will have to flee. So we give God honor and we give God glory. We can't stand that praise. That's why he was kicked out of heaven because he wanted God's praise when he says he would exalt his throne above the stars of God and he will do all these things. And then he fell from heaven like lightning. So back to this story in Mark chapter 9. I don't even know if we're going to get back into Mark chapter 5 where the Holy Spirit is taking us wherever he, he wants us to go. 
because did this child he he was going through so much let's go back to mark 9 verse 18 and whenever it lays holes of him that's the devil so as to make it its own it dashes him down so the devil possessed him you know he wants him to do his own dirty work and then he, he dashes him down he's hurting him and convulses him and he foams at the mouth and grinds at his feet and he falls into a motionless stupor as if wasting away and i asked your disciples to drive it out and they were not able to do it and we proved it in um Matthew chapter 10 verse 1 that they had the ability and they were paralyzed with fear verse 19 and he said to them oh unbelieving generation without any faith so jesus was not pleased with his disciples inability to cast out the demon even though they had the ability and and they didn't do it they let fear rule in their hearts on that occasion this was like when peter was walking on water he was doing great and then he took his eyes off of jesus onto the circumstances he felt the wind the rough waves and then he began to sink so keep your eyes on jesus and you're gonna pass the test you will pass every test we are more than conquerors we can do all things through christ which strengthens us he always gives us the surpassing victory and since god be for us i'm not going to say if god be for us because if you're a born again christian god is for you since god be for us who can be against us tribulations peril persecution Nothing shall separate us from the love of God. He who spared not his only son for us and he will come true for us. And he is a present help in a time of trouble. And I always said before, I've said it several times. You don't have to wait until you get into trouble to seek God. Hallelujah. He will help you. <coughs> if you listen to him, excuse me, he will prevent you from even getting into the trouble. Praise the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. So Jesus was telling his disciples off and he answered them, Oh, unbelieving generation without any faith, how long shall I have to do with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. So Jesus wasn't afraid. There's no fear in love. Perfect love cast it out fear because fear had torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. So another way of dealing with fear of or getting rid of fear is knowing the length, the depth, and the height of the love God has for us. And remembering that he's always with us. If God is with you, we have nothing to fear. Absolutely nothing to fear. Verse 20. So they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, at once it so the spirit was a it is not a human being we have a body you know they um evil spirits they need a body to inhabit so they can do their dirty work the devil gets people to do work for them and then he kills steals and destroys them so um yes so when they brought the boy to him and when the spirit saw him at once it completely convulsed the boy and he fell to the ground and kept rolling about foaming at the mouth so he's making a spectacle of himself bringing about fear in people you know that was satan's power he's a bully he only comes to steal kill and destroy but thank god jesus came that we might have life and have it more abundantly thank god he is a good shepherd who gave his life for the sheep thank god he always causes us to triumph he always gives us the victory and causes us to triumph thank god that greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world thank god we are more than conquerors and thank god that he who the sun sets free is free indeed verse 21 and Jesus asked his father, how long has he had this? He answered, from the time he was a little boy. I believe I speak about this story in my book, God is Willing to Make You Whole. That's a good um, book to get. And you can read. You can read that. It's available from Amazon. Don't worry, this stripe because this is just the proof. But this book is available from Amazon. God is Willing to Make You Whole. And I believe I speak more about that in this book. So you can go ahead and purchase it and enjoy the reading and learn more about the ability God has given you. Right, verse 21. And Jesus asked his father, how long has he had it? And he answered, from the time he was a little boy. So that was a long time. I could imagine this little boy was a very lonely boy. He wouldn't have had many friends. People would have had to have been very brave to come around to, to his house parents would have been afraid that he would have hurt their babies their little ones so this guy and his son they must have lived a very lonely life and it was often 
sorry, and it has often thrown him both into the fire and into the water. Can you imagine having a little child and the devil is doing that? You don't know what's going to happen. So this father had to be glued to this, to stick to this boy like glue. It, the text mentions no, it makes no mention of him having a mom. I don't know if the mom had died. I don't know if the mom had left them because of this horrible situation that was going on. But I don't think many people were associated with them because they would have been ashamed to be seen in public with them. How can you be hanging out with this sort? So how can you be endangering your baby, you know, by having them hanging out with this guy when the little son is having all these seizures and the, the spirit is dashing him into the water and into the fire to kill him, intending to kill him. This is verse 22. But if you can do anything, do have pity on us and help us. If. <laughs> it says that the devil was saying to Jesus, if you are the son of God, turn these stones into bread. If you are this, do this, do that. But Jesus knew who he was in Christ and he doesn't take orders from the devil. And Jesus said, you say to me, if I can do anything. So he turned it around. Why? All. Everybody say all. <laughs> Audience say all. All things are possible to him who believes. And at once the father of the boy gave an eager, piercing, inarculate cry with tears and said, Lord, I believe. You know, he believes that Jesus could do this thing, could cast this evil spirit out of his son. And now, but he had a bit of unbelief. He says, constantly help my weakness of faith. Verse 25. But Jesus noticed that a crowd of people came running together. He rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, you see, you have to speak like we were talking. Speak the word. He just didn't keep his mouth shut. If he kept his mouth shut, nothing would have happened. You dumb and deaf spirit, I charge you to come out of him and never go into him again. It's like with Paul and Silas, with the woman, the slave girl, she had a spirit of divination. At the hour of prayer, she kept interrupting them, saying, these men are, uh, uh, these are, well, sons of the most high God and things like that. And, and Paul, I was a Paul, he got fed up and he just cast that spirit out of her and she was no longer able to do her fortune telling. So you have to speak the word. And after giving a coarse, clamoring, fear-stricken shriek of anguish and convulsing him terribly, you know, see so had this guy rolling around, I think his eyes were rolling. To the back of his head you're probably just seeing the white of his eyes it was just like worst horrible um horror picture that you have seen terrifying image it came out you know so jesus didn't flee from fear out of his presence he continued to do what he was doing and the boy lay pale and motionless like a corpse so that many of them said he is dead so that's what the devil is after he's after your life he only comes to steal kill and destroy you might think he's just giving you a call but if he had his way and he could kill you with that common call that's what he would do so you need to speak the word every time something small happens to you whether you're getting a common call a sneeze or whatever you need to tell it to be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea and say you're healed by the stripes of jesus because little things can grow into big things. It can grow into pneumonia and different things. You need to cast down imaginations and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God because it's exalting itself against the knowledge of God that says by his stripes, we are healed. But Jesus took a strong grip of his hand and began lifting him up and he stood. And when he had gone indoors, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we drive it out? You see, they didn't give it a him, it's a it. The evil spirit, praise God. And he replied to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer and fasting. He's not saying the unclean spirit can't be cast out only by prayer and fasting. He's saying this kind of unbelief. You need to get rid of the unbelief so that the faith can work properly. It's, it's just like if, 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 if you've got water and, and it's pure and everything, great, and you can drink it. But if someone puts a drop of poison in that water, it contaminates it. So then it needs to get that poison out so that it can be good for you for drinking purposes. It's the same thing with your faith. You got to strip it of unbelief so it can work properly. It's like if you got a car and it's running with petrol, if you put some diesel and mix it up with the petrol, it will not work properly. Maybe it won't work and you'll be having to get the AA out a lot sooner than you thought or whichever um, 
rescue service that you're using. So we're going to close. I don't, we're not going to go back to Mark chapter five today because time is running out. Verse 30. They went on from there and passed along through Galilee and he did not wish to have anyone know about it. Verse 31, as we conclude, for we, he was engaged for the time being in teaching his disciples. He said to them, the son of man is being delivered into the hands of men and they will put him to death. And when they have killed him after three days, he will rise from the dead. So when he was crucified, they, many of them thought he wasn't coming back and they were grieving and so on. And then he showed himself to many of them. One time he showed himself to them and um, what's his name was not there. Thomas was not there and he was doubting. He said he would not believe until he put his hand in his side and all these different things that he wanted to do. But Jesus said, um, blessed are those who believe who haven't seen. So we're going to end there for tonight thank you so much for watching uh continue to study the word continue to praise the lord i know we don't have a praise and worship service on this broadcast but you do your own praise and worship at home serve the lord with gladness or whichever church you're going to and whatever and thank you so much for watching have a great day be blessed remember you're blessed in the city you're blessed in the field you're blessed in your coming in and you're blessed in your going out and you don't have to fear because God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. And he is with you. And since God be for us, who can be against us? He's given us all things that pertain unto life.